Hello, everybody. This is Jim Ransom with another episode of Morning Jim. Are you ready for some poetry today? It may be morning or it may be evening. In the morning with a cup of coffee is great. But so is poetry in, in the evening to help subdue the pace of a fretful day, for example. And perhaps you might have a tot of whiskey with you or a glass of wine or even a G and T. But that's fine. Today we're going to have a conjuries of poems by several different authors. No single theme, um, starting with one of my own. I will have to say of these poems that none of them are particularly humorous. Um, and <clears throat> so I apologize for that because I usually like to get a little humor into the course of the day. <clears throat> but uh, the first one here that I wrote is called Masking Up. And um, it will eventually be modified, I suspect, maybe improved, maybe not. It was one of a series of poems I've written during the virus pandemic. Our views change, don't they? Right now we are all in transition, some further along than others who remain masked and frightened. <clears throat> it, it does, it's well to ask ourselves, I think, if we get vaccinated and then we are found wearing a mask, uh, ask ourselves, well, why did we get vaccinated if we still have to wear a mask? <clears throat> Our president still hasn't figured that out. But let me read the poem, Masking Up. They enter church on the spring breeze, masked up and still fearful, feeling taunted by smiling people in their cars, immunized and heading for a ball game. The dwindling churchmen, the churchwomen too, all jabbed and healthy, but still afraid of the shadow of death, protected but still fearing evil, a miracle already active in their bodies, but their minds shattered by bad information, bad leadership. They will sing no hymns. God's word is muffled in the mask. Freedom lives in their bodies, but not in their minds. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to get rid of fear. I understand that. <clears throat> um, especially once it has its grip. When the president spoke to a mostly empty Senate chamber with all the members fully vaccinated before any of the rest of us, I'm sure. Um, but still all masked. I shook my head. Now let's change the subject. <clears throat> um, this past week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, I'm not sure, uh, a famous poet named Lawrence Ferlinghetti died at the age of 90. He was a member of the Beat Generation, and <laughs> most of them didn't live to be 90 years old. Um, but Ferlinghetti was a capitalist at heart as well as a poet. And he opened a bookstore called City Lights in San Francisco, which has become an iconic place for uh, book lovers and poetry lovers. Uh, and so <clears throat> um, his book uh, called the Coney Island of the Mind, let me show it to you here, uh, was written <clears throat> in uh, the 19, most of it was written in the 1950s, um, and it's become a modern classic. This book, believe it or not, has sold more than a million copies around the world and been translated into a number of languages, which is not that easy to do with poetry. Um, 
In fact, if you want to be a poet in the academic community, um, you probably better do some translations to firm up your poetic and linguistic chops. <clears throat> now, the poem I'm going to read you has no name. Um, it's, uh, and not all of his poems were like this, but it's a poem with a lot of indented lines and uh, stops and starts up and down the page and a lot of internal rhyming. Um, so let's start with it. Constantly risking absurdity and death, whenever he performs above the heads of his audience, the poet, like an acrobat, climbs on rhyme to a high wire of his own making and balancing on eye beams above a sea of faces, paces his way to the other side of day, performing entrechets and sleight of foot tricks and other high theatrics, and all without mistaking anything for what it may not be. For he's a super realist who must perforce perceive taught truth before the taking of each stance or step in his supposed advance toward that still higher perch where beauty stands and waits with gravity to start her death-defying leap. And he, a little Charlie Chaplin man, who may or may not catch her fair eternal form, spread eagle in the empty air of existence. There's a lot of irony and a lot of self-doubt. <laughs> Poets have all felt that in writing their own poems. So I think that poet, that poem is uh, one that's very, very um, uh, useful for poets to read, and I hope for non-poets to hear as well. <clears throat> A friend of mine gave me a copy of this book this past week, and it was just exactly what I needed to finish the poem that I read you earlier. <laughs> okay, the next poem I'm going to read you is uh, a rather sad poem by John Updike. John Updike, of course, was known for his um, uh, for his novels, and not so much for his poetry. But he wrote quite a few poems, and I'm going to read you one that I found very moving, as a dog lover and former dog owner. <clears throat> um, it's called Dog's Death. She must have been kicked unseen or brushed by a car. Too young to know much, she was beginning to learn to use the newspaper spread on the kitchen floor and to win wedding there the words, good dog, Good dog. We thought her shy malaise was a shot reaction. The autopsy disclosed a rupture in her liver. As we teased her with play, blood was filling her skin and her heart was learning to lie down forever. Monday morning, as the children were noisily fed and sent to school, she crawled beneath the youngest's bed. We found her twisted, limp, but still alive. In the cart of the vets on my lap, she tried to bite my hand and died. I stroked her warm fur, and my wife called in a voice imperious with tears. Though surrounded by love that would have upheld her, Nevertheless, she sank 
and stiffening disappeared. Back home, we found that in the night, her frame, drawing near to dissolution, had endured the shame of diarrhea and had dragged across the floor to a newspaper carelessly left there. Good talk. Okay. I don't think that extremely well-written poem needs any lengthy discussion of what it means. We know what it means. Most of us have been with a dog that died, and it was not fun. But dogs are such loving and lovely creatures that we, we went out and bought another one or somebody who felt really sorry for us gave us one. And sometimes the free ones were the best ones. Finally, I'm going to read a thoughtful poem by Topeka's own Eric McHenry from his book, Odd Evening. And I think I've read at least one poem from that book before. <clears throat> This poem is called, Randy Used the Word. When Randy used the word as though it were a word that anyone might use, I don't know what I thought. I flared his cape with my forearms and shifted in his chair. I know I didn't think of Tony's hair, a high top fade that Randy would have no idea how to fix. I know I said nothing, by which I must have meant, continue filling my ears with trimmings, dust my nape with talcum, offer me impartial views of both sides of the back of my head. And outside, let the barber's pole continue its reenactment. Let the silver ball recall the bowl of leeches. Let the helical progress illusion of the stripes remain the blood, the twining bandage, and the vein. America, and I'm about to talk directly to the Eric in you. You had to pay for that one, but the man you say you mean to be will walk out of some barber shops with his hair half cut. I think you get the idea that uh, the poet or the speaker in the poem is sitting in the barber shop, and Randy, the barber, used the word. I have my own idea of what the word was, but um, the poet doesn't say what the word was, but I think we all have to imagine uh, all the words that we would not want to hear uh, when our hair is being cut. Words that might have indicated that he's made a terrible mistake. Um, words that might indicate that his sensibilities about language are way different than ours are. Words that um, do not offer impartial views of both sides of whatever. So, Randy used the word. This is a poem of somewhat hidden meanings that, that turns it over to us, the audience, to decide what we would not want Randy to say. Thank you, Eric McHenry, for a great poem. That's it for today. We're having a slightly shorter session than we sometimes have. Um, what a conjuries of different subjects and styles we heard today. 
but all are full of their own unique ironies and messages. I hope you all have a great day, or perhaps if you're listening in the evening, I would say sleep well tonight. But if you do, it may be that you didn't fully understand the poems I read. No, I'm not going to say that. Uh, poems sometimes linger in our minds, but they don't have to. Because after all, we can always buy the book and read it again. Or you can always send me an email and ask me to read it again. Or you may send me an email and say, no, don't read it again. Everything is possible in this life, and those are just a few of the possibilities. But I'm going to thank you once again for being with me today, and I hope you'll join me for some more poems read out loud a week from now. And I hope until then, your life is good, not too frustrating, and that the weather is amenable to some time outdoors. Bye now.